Our next presentation is from our friends from Fujitsu. I would like to welcome Wilfred and Adesh. They, both of them came from the States, by the way, so let's hear it from them. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Wilfred Klerus. I don't come from the States, that's my <laughs> colleague Adesh. <laughs> he comes from our partner at CA from the States. Maybe a short introduction of yourself. Yeah, I won't bore you with the introduction, but uh, Adish Fule, uh, I work for CA Technologies. I'm based out of uh, California in uh, the United States. So happy to be here. And, uh, luckily, the weather is really good today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and I come from Waldorf, that's uh, close to uh, Heidelberg. Yeah, that's a bit of a Rhine, not far away. So uh, I was well, we also <laughs> and we would like to talk a little bit what we are doing in the area of data center management and automation where we combined artificial intelligence and automation because we are sure that we can bring a real value to our customers when we have not only one topic when we are able to combine this. Yeah. I will give you a short overview of uh, what Fujitsu is doing. So that slide gives a short overview of how we define artificial intelligence. So that we have here a technology which allows us yeah, to, uh, to do tasks with computers where you normally need humans yeah, for, for doing that. And that is really a great opportunity yeah, for, for the business of our customers to use such technologies. And uh, Fujitsu had defined uh, solutions around that, and we have a brand for AI solution, and that brand is Sinrai. Yeah? So Sinrai is a headline for all AI solutions coming from Fujitsu, mm -hmm. and we have a program where we work very close with our customers, where we bring together ideas from customers, where we bring together ideas from our partners, like CA and our expertise, and where we are developing such similar solutions, where we com combine this. And here you have some examples yeah, where we have uh, such solutions in action. Uh, the first one is AI quality control. Here we have a solution uh, together developed with uh, Siemens, where we are able to uh, maintain wind turbines. So with the AI we are able to do maintenance and to find problems before the cure. Yeah, that's one solution. Then we have another solution, the AI customer flow analysis, make the invisible visible. So here with cameras we can identify in, in cities what's ongoing and here we have solutions to control the traffic flow to manage uh, the, the entire environment of, of cities. And last but not least, or one, one other example is AI in predictive maintenance, yeah, keeping the lights on. So to control complex environments, to find out what's ongoing, also to find out what's, what's happening on such computer systems so that you can identify if somebody is hacking, that everything is normal or some hackings are ongoing. And here I have my colleague Adesh with me and he will tell you and explain how it works in detail. Yeah, what is Fujitsu doing? Fujitsu EPS stands for Enterprise Platform Services. And our goal is clearly to, def to deliver to our customers hyper-connected <laughs> services. Not only one building block, so our goal is to combine this with business requirements and uh, important for us to combine here security, cloud, internet of things, big data, AI and automation and to deliver, to deliver complete solutions to our customers. And uh, for doing that we have a complete portfolio under the headline of data center management automation where we have solutions for network management, server storage, cloud, application and IT service management together where these components are built in in the data center so that we are able to model 
a digital twin of a data center so that you could also manage the entire infrastructure, the energy which is consumed, the power, the assets in a data center. And uh, before we are doing this, we have here reference architecture where we are structuring the situation at our customer side to find out what is the situation currently at the customer side, which tools, which solutions are implemented and also to identify where to move and what can be implemented in the future. So that is not a product selling approach or something like that. First thing is very important for us, listening. And the reference architecture works as the following. So in the middle, we have the hardware, the servers, the storage, the network components. And what you normally have to do, you have to bring in new firmwares, BIOS profiles, then you have to bring as the next operating system on such environments. You would like to offer a, a self-service point and service catalog, CIT services to the business automatically with the portal. It's a topic comes up uh, from entitlement, which, which, uh, which uh, employees, which partners, which end customers will get access to, to such a service. Then we have here a huge cluster for, to implement financial management. Then you have to operate the whole environment with a service desk and a CMD. Then you have multiple monitoring solutions in place to control all this environment. We have a service level management on top as a manager of managers. You could implement a service catalog. You can do also, oops, that was a wrong button. You can also do capacity management and reporting with, uh, with this so that you know exactly if you would like to migrate applications from dedicated hardware into the virtual world, how much computing power is required. If you need more, you can do it by pressing a button. Then you have a huge cluster for life, for asset management and life cycle management, that means that you clearly get the information what is my investment in, this, in such a whole environment. Uh, also that you have answers when I have to substitute old hardware with new hardware and a huge cluster for process automation and to integrate also AI in the process automation. That, that we are not only implementing just another piece of software so to make sure that the information flows and that we are automating and that we are combining automating and art, artificial intelligence in an uh, end-to-end solution for our customers. It's also important to find out at which maturity level a customer is today and where, where he has to be tomorrow to support his business best. And here we have a methodology coming from Gardner where we are doing a clear analyze on that and where we clearly can show what, what efforts are necessary for the next step at a customer. And to come from one level to the next, that's not a task which could be done during a, a weekend or a month. That takes something like half a year or uh, one year yeah, to improve this, to implement all such uh, stuff in a data center. By doing that, what's very important, that's not only technical. You may need also the subject matter experts which are not IT experts at a customer, so that they clearly can talk about what they require, that they can talk about the, their processes yeah, from their point of view, and that is always step one when we talk about automation or integration of artificial intelligence. What is a business process? Uh, they define the BPM2 models, and based on the BPM2 models, then we start with the automation and the integration of the solutions. Very important. Process first, and then the, the digital transformation starts. And that, that's what we have done in the public sector at IT Niedersachsen, very successful. And uh, such solutions could be also rolled out across multiple countries in Germany, as an example. Yeah. I talk now about data center management and automation. That's a complete portfolio of solutions for doing that process first. And then 
the digital transformation can be implemented very successful. Uh, we cover the entire stack from the network up to the data center and uh, yeah, we have long standing experience in automation and also with autonomous functionality by doing that. And now that was the overall story about that. Now I would like to hand over to my colleague Adesh who explains a little bit how does such a solution is working in the area of artificial intelligence. Adesh. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, um, as I said, I come from CA Technologies. How many of you have heard of CA Technologies? Wow, oh, okay. Uh, excellent, that's why I'm here. So, uh, uh, but not to talk about the company, but uh, just to give you a little background behind this session. Um, uh, so basically what we do, or at least the team that I work for, um, our job is to help uh, enterprises keep the applications up and running. So we monitor everything from your cloud assets to down to the mainframe, everything in between, application, networks, fault, business processes, all of that. And uh, uh, the, uh, and I'm not trying to tell you this because I want to promote CA, but uh, I don't work in marketing, by the way. <laughs> I'm in R&D, so um, the, 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 the reason I tell you this is there are two challenges that typically our customers have. Right? One is an outage. Uh, which is uh, devices down, services down. You know, when when you're accessing your you know YouTube application and the video stops streaming, you have a problem, right? So people are worried about such things. Right? They don't want the service to be disrupted. Uh, but that's one class of problem. The more interesting problem are subtle changes in performance, right? Like uh, if my web page typically loads in 1.7 seconds, and on this day it's taking three seconds. Well, What's the difference between 1.7 and 3? It's very minute, but it makes a big difference. And so we, you know, hear about these class of problems uh, from our customers. And you know, every time business is down, you lose money. Uh, similarly, you know, if pages don't load on time, you know, customers are unhappy. You lose money, right? especially these days when everyone's uh, making money on ad revenue. Right? You want their pages to be loaded in time, clicks to be in time, all of that. And so uh, those are the two key things that we are helping our customers avoid. Now, uh, if you look at a life of an, uh, of an administrator, right, an infrastructure administrator, like what do they do daily, right? They'll, uh, you know, they're given a bunch of, they're, they're given an application which has you know, software components, their virtual machines, there could be Docker containers, physical servers, mainframes, all of that. And so, you know, this, this person is deploying agents, collecting metrics, events, setting thresholds, you know, looking at dashboards, and that's what they do on a daily basis, right? And uh, what they also do, and what they hate to do, is look at this, you know, page which has a scrolling list of alarms coming in from different places, and then there's your boss calling you, okay, what's going on? What's, why are things red, right? Fix this problem, this is slow, right? It's a horrible life. Uh, um, well, in case you're trying to pursue that career, it's not that bad, but we make it easier. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it is challenging. And so the more we can simplify their life, right, uh, you know, the, the better it is. And so what, what we are trying to do is, you know, if you look at all the tools that you have across your performance monitoring, your uh, event management, your business operations, right, there is a lot of data out there. I mean, people, you know, we have some customers who are streaming in like two terabytes of data, uh, and this is pure monitoring, you know, like infrastructure monitoring. This is not like Twitter feeds coming in, right? This is purely infrastructure monitoring data coming in, and you're getting like two, three terabytes per day, right? And that's just the volume, right? So, uh, uh, so that's a lot of data to deal with, right? So, um, you know, so if we can get all of this data in, in one place, and then you can, you know, provide some automated intelligence to them, well, it really makes them happy, right? As I said, the less I sit and watching a screen scrolling by, uh, the better it is for me, the better my life is, and the better the company works as well, right? Fewer downtimes, fewer problems. Uh, so how do we get to this vision? So the uh, marketing team really likes animation, so. <laughs> so uh, all right, so, so yeah, so the, the first problem is get the data in and normalize it. 
And that itself is a hard problem. Right? So we have data coming in all these different sources. And uh, while I would love to say all of this is CA, I mean, every enterprise has other tools as well. I mean, you have a combination of CA and non-CA tools in there. And each tool today has a different database schema. They have different naming conventions. They have you know, all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, uh, conventions that they use. And so normalizing this data and persisting it in a single place is a challenge itself. Then you will have breakages in monitoring. So you have these you know, gaps in your data collection. So all of this has to be cleaned, you know, data has to be normalized and persisted so that it can be used by your algorithms or dashboarding tools or whatever. Uh, so that's step one, like just, like let's just get the data together and keep it in a proper fashion. Next is we want to apply uh, different algorithms. And I'll talk more about this in a subsequent slide. Uh, but the idea is once you have nice, clean, decorated data and annotated data, then analyzing it becomes much easier. Right? So you can apply your you know, different uh, anomaly detection, pattern detection, whatever, and you know, some prediction capabilities, all of that. And we'll get into it in a second. Uh, but then I start to apply and get insights out of it, right? which is uh, what, what you know, insight is basically something that I can take an action on. Right? So I would take, uh, it could be a remedial action, like, you know, like go fix this, right? and, you know, like this filled up. Go clean. Uh, let's say my, my Docker container died. Right? So you know why did it die? Well, maybe it's out of memory. So can I go resize my VM or something like that? Right? So it really depends on the type of problems that you have, uh, and that's where the third step is. Right? Today um, there is automation. You know, like people write scripts. People write. Uh, you have your Kubernetes cluster, which will automatically bring things up, and all that is great. But what's not connected is you know, we have class of tools that tell you insights, you have dashboards where you can learn stuff, but it's not connected to your automation directly. So there's still a human being, you know, that's looking at the results and saying, oh, I need to run that. So that's, um, so basically what we want to do is kind of streamline this entire process and you're looking for like end-to-end -end automation. And that's exactly what we do. Um, <clears throat> we collect data from multiple sources, we put in a, um, in a data lake or I don't want to use buzzwords, but you know it is a central store where we dump all this data in, and all the analysis happens on top of that. And then, you know, given our field, yeah, you know, as I said, our our users typically have these challenges, which is, can can you make the alarm smarter? I don't want to keep setting thresholds, uh, you know, every time. Um, and um, you know, can you reduce the number of alerts? You know, and to give you a simple example, um, you know, you have your network, one of the switches port goes bad. And then there are like 15 different tools telling you that there is something wrong because the network tool say, hey, port bad, uh, the virtual machine now doesn't have access, the Docker container fails. Everybody is sending you redundant alerts, um, and I don't need that. I mean, I, I'm a smart guy. You tell me once, I understand. Uh, so how can we filter out the noise and only tell you this once that hey, there's something wrong? Go look at it. Right? That's that's what we want at the end of the day. Uh, and my son will attest to that. Like I tell him ten times a day, don't do something, and he's like, "Stop, Dad! Right? I don't want to, you know, stop telling me the same thing again and again." So, you know, uh, we all human beings are the same. So, <clears throat> so the way, um, you know, so one of the key components, as I said, is you know, let's put the data um, in, uh, you know, in a single, you know, single location. And so this is, you know, CS solution, which we call as operational intelligence. Um, and the idea there is, um, you know, I think of it as a two-layered solution, essentially. Uh, there's a data lake component, which uh, uh, which is actually not that exciting. We use like Elasticsearch, uh, we use for our, um, you know, uh, for our different data sources that we ingest. And then if you look at uh, uh, all these components, uh, so we have uh, data coming in from my, my business services, I have application like transactions, metric, topology, all of that. I have infrastructure, metrics, alarms, logs, right? So logs and traces, unstructured data, right? And metrics, alarms, events, topology is what we call a structured data, right? So there are relationships um, and it's well formed. So all of that data goes, sits in our, our data lake, which is a combination of Elasticsearch and we use Postgres for storing uh, you know, relational stuff. Um, and um, we use Kafka for streaming because we have voluminous amount of data coming in. Um, and then for our computations, we use Spark, uh, which is an in-memory, if you're not familiar with that, it's an in-memory uh, processing uh, uh, you know, component. 
And so basically we have a bunch of technologies and people want multi-tenants and security, all that stuff. So it's all you know baked into this layer. Uh, but the interesting part is uh, is the top part for me, which is the intelligence layer where you know we have some visual we have a visualization component so you can see dashboards and stuff. Then the data science modules. Um, you don't need machine learning for everything. Statistics works in some cases. So it's a combination of statistics and some new machine learning algorithms that, that we work on. And then that's what the user gets to consume in terms of insights. And finally, these insights trigger your automated actions, right? So that's how you know the data flows in. It comes in, sits here, uh, it's picked up by these modules, processed, um, you know, stored back into the data lake, and then you know you have API access to right, get data in and out. Um, any questions about this before I move? No, all making sense. Perfect. Uh, I need to tell my boss what a great uh, you know, what I do <laughs> No questions. <laughs> uh, time for a race, maybe. So, uh, uh, so uh, we look at the problem space, and you know we break the problem space into four buckets. Right. So, you know, life starts with prediction. Right? If I can predict that there's an accident waiting to happen, then we can avoid it, right? Makes life easier. Uh, and so the more we can predict, the better. Uh, of course, uh, you know, prediction, so we have different algorithms we use, different forms of forecasting, different forms of regressions, uh, for capacity, for outages, for performance issues, and all of that. Um, and so, and even service availability. And so the more, you know, prediction that we can provide, uh, insight we can provide to the user, the better it is, it makes that life easier. Uh, but prediction you know, hasn't been perfected. If it was, we would all predict stock markets and all be millennials, right? But it hasn't happened. So prediction is still a, is a, is a new science. Right? Uh, I shouldn't say new science, but it's not like, you know, it doesn't predict everything. Right? So you still will have situations that uh, are not caught by a prediction component, and it happens, right? And stuff happens all the time, things break. And that's where you need to be. Um, you know your detection component needs to be very efficient, and even there we are, you know, we are trying to generate new baselines because nobody loves setting you know, thresholds on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. You know, keep changing values. So we use different smoothing techniques, do differential analysis, and then also do anomaly detection, both univariate and multivariate. What that means is, you know, you can uh, you have a time series data, and you can right. use you know that single dimension, and you can. Uh, you know, see anomalous behavior, right? So that's for a single metric. And then multivariate analysis essentially means um, you're looking at multiple metrics and you're trying to identify, like, when these four metrics or these five kind of behave in a certain fashion, they together indicate a problem, right? So the first univariate is much simpler, the multivariate is more challenging, and, um, you know, we have we use various neural nets and, uh, you know, random forest and other algorithms out there. Uh, we have a breakout session, uh, workshop session at 3.30, right? Yeah, yeah 3.30, and we'll you know, deep dive into two of the algorithms that we use as part of the workshop. Um, but I'm just kind of giving you an overview of, of stuff we are doing. Uh, so detection, next is root cause analysis, right? So detection will generate a bunch of uh, high quality alarms for you. Uh, next is root cause, right? I mean, I go to the doctor, I say, doctor, my leg heart hurts. So the doctor will say, take an x-ray, do an MRI, whatever, take a CD scan, hopefully not, but look at my brain, maybe I'm just imagining it. You know, stuff like that. So the doctor will basically ask me for a bunch of data, and then we'll look at it and do root cause analysis. Like, okay, let's find out what's what's the root cause that's causing that pain, right? So this is the same thing, right? So uh, essentially, we get to play with three types of, you know, three dimensions of data. There's temporal, time, right? So look at a window and say, oh, something happened within this window, right? So, um, so deciding what that window is a challenge in itself. Uh, the second is looking at topology, right, which is relationships essentially, or service maps, and you know, different names for it. But basically, if I know how a device or a software component is related to the other, uh, I can easily walk the tree or walk the graph and you know find out dependencies and that. So that's the the other type of data that we have access to. And the third is just dex or metadata, right. Like when alarms are triggered, they come with this big description, right? Oh, this server is out of memory, 
um, by X percentage and you know something else happens. So it tells a big story. Uh, and generally humans read that and you know make sense out of it. But here we have access to all that information. So time, topology, text. So these three data sources. And so you know we use various um, you know various techniques, natural language processing, subsequence mining, graph travel, so on. So we use different techniques there uh, to try to use these three dimensions, make sense out of it. And, tell you what a root cause would be in given certain scenarios. And finally, it's the prescription. So, um, yeah, so once you go through root cause, right, the next is what action should I take? Right? So when I told you what the problem is, now how do I go about fixing it? And in that case, you know, we do, uh, uh, again, based on uh, the hierarchy, uh, you know, based on the topology, we can you know, give you some insights or we even look at historically what you've done and we can you know, tell you this is what you did in the past, you can try these things again. So look at a, a library of fixed actions and be able to tell you, uh, you know, what, what is the action to take to you know, fix that root cause. Right? So that's the general process, uh, that's the general philosophy we follow. And then, you know, we, we work through, iterate through these algorithms all the time. Uh, we use, um, you know, as the name suggests, both uh, unsupervised and supervised learning form. Uh, types of machine learning. Um, getting data from, like, our customers are large enterprises. So think of your favorite bank, your insurance, your hospital, right? They all use CA tools. And they have such strict privacy laws and, you know, with the GDPR thing coming, life gets even harder. So um, we, we don't always, we aren't lucky enough to get their data back, right? So uh, for us, you know, doing supervised learning is really challenging just from a logistical purposes. And so we end up say, spending a lot of time setting up uh, simulation labs and all of that. Right? And I'll talk about that in the workshop. But you know, doing simple things like detecting a memory leak for an application is a challenge because you know, how do you simulate that? Right? So we, we build simulators, we train, we get all the data using these simulators, train the model, all of that. Uh, and then you know you you train your child and you or your whatever ninja warrior and you send it out in the world to the customer side. And we get very limited feedback back unless you're on WebEx call with them and you ask for feedback because right? all the data gets stored back in. So we hope the, the, the algorithms are learning to learn about itself uh, and hopefully doing a good job. But you know, that's one of just logistical challenges. It's not a data science problem. But um, that's why we, but my point was that, so we try to use a lot of unsupervised learning so we don't have to train the models. Uh, but then, uh, you know, for certain very focused use cases, we uh, we do much uh, supervised uh, model uh, uh, in classification. Uh, so of course our customers love our products. Um, so will you? So um, any any students uh, in the crowd? Uh, be an administrator. It's a good time. We have some awesome tools to use. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, our marketing team loves to poll uh, our customers on a regular basis, and we get some amazing numbers. If you ask me, how did we get 60% faster in TTN, I can't tell you that, but maybe our marketing team can. But you know, idea is the you know on a, on a serious note, MTTR is you know mean time to the web, uh, and the idea is I had a problem and I fixed it. Right? I detected it, I started working on it, and eventually I fixed it. So people count how long it took from you know detection down to resolution, and that's a metric that's used to track the efficiency. Of your operations, so it's actually a very important metric. And currently, you know, uh, based on some recent results, uh, they anticipate it takes about four and a half hours uh, across various issues, right? So these could range from your desktop problems down to IT problems, you know, like your data center problems. Uh, so four and a half hours on an average to resolve, to detect, to, to root cause, and fix it. That's a very long time, right? And so there is constant fight to reduce that time down to, and so you, you're tracking, you know, as you said, you know, your your IT operations by entirety is being tracked by these metrics. So a lot of people track this, and many of the conversations we have with our customer, they would ask us, like, is there a way for you to monitor this and report, right? How much have we improved over time? So it's a very interesting thing. And so prediction plays a big part, and if the problem doesn't occur, I don't have to fix it. So. Life gets better. Um, you know, efficiency. Yes, if I can do things faster, quicker, of course, 
you know, I'll have more time to go out and you know, grab a beer. So, you know, of course, that's that's important. And then, um, you know, cost. Not to, I don't need to tell you about that. If we can do things cheaper, you know, why not? So, um, so yeah, you know, customers are seeing some benefits, and uh, you know, instead of um, you know, a person sitting there looking at a screen and trying to figure things out, you have now your own personal assistant in AI uh, doing the work for you and giving you the results. So, of course, uh, make things better. And I think that was my last slide. Do you want to do? Yes. Yeah, I said that were some facts yeah, where we use you know, such uh, AI technology in, in our data centers. Maybe I can tell you, I, I thought I would like to have fun also in my life. And I thought about, I can, how can I explain my wife and my father yeah, how AI works? And we had a birthday party yeah, and I thought maybe we can use AI, combine this with a little bit of automation and I found, I found a guy who had a cocktail robot yeah, to producing cocktails. And I thought, yeah, so what? Are they with uh, AI software? Maybe my hobby is making photos, yeah. So I had a photo box, yeah. And I said, my guests, when they come in, will make a photo of these guys. Then I will give this photo to the AI software. The AI software will analyze where is the face and can tell my guests what's their favorite cocktail drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can produce. The cocktail automatically, yeah? and we have implemented this. And I have to tell you, key topic is learning. Like if you have a kid, you yeah? so I have at first I need a party and I have to ask the guys, here's my cocktail menu. Uh, can I make a photo of you? Then you have to give me feedback. What's your favorite cocktail drink? And we see data set. So we had something like 100 data sets. It was possible to train the AI software so for my party when the guests come in I was able to make a photo and I had a hit list of around about 70% yeah, when it was co correct so we, everybody was impressed, understand how AI works and got a nice cocktail drink and I also learned a lot yeah, which power is in such a technology. And if you would like to understand this a little bit more in deeper, we have a workshop here at uh, 3.30 in the black room. Or black, black room, black, black room, not the dark room, the black room, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's meet in the, in the black room at 3.30. Thank you very much. He told me it's more time. We have uh, questions to answer. Any questions to us? There is one. The system administration is one of the times. So, one question. Like you did mention that you are using uh, supervised learning. Yes. So, one of the efforts you need to put a labeling to earlier issues. How do you deal with uh, you know, uh, fast data? So, uh, so that's a very broad thanks. That's a very broad question, right? So I'll give you a simple example. In you know applications, especially if you have Java applications, the memory leaks that happen, right? So basically, your you know, application makes a memory you know allocation and doesn't release it, right? Some piece of code, right? and then your memory usage keeps on going up. Eventually, the system craps out a lot of memory. So uh, how do you detect something like that, right? So it, it's it's a very hard problem, and so. What we have, what we spend time doing is number one, identifying the blame metrics. Right, so you have uh, any application marketing tool has a list of you know different metrics. So we have like garbage collection level metrics uh, that we identified, and so we looked at them. So we eventually shortened the list down to five or six. Uh, I can't tell you what they are because uh, that's the work we do. But uh, uh, you know, and, and so we get that, and we ended up setting our own simulation lab. Where we have a you know dummy application which can simulate memory leaks, right? And so what we do is basically you know automate in an automated fashion we different time of the day different you know for changing different metric values we start to generate these memory leaks and so we start to build out our you know annotated data set. Right? Annotations are the hardest thing, right? uh, and so we build sort of a library with that and train the model using that uh, training data set. Then. When you know some of our customers do share data with us, right? So 
um, it's really hard to find annotated data from customers because that means somebody has to be watching and saying, oh, this is when memory leak happened, let me capture this for C. That never happened. I would love for that. So data, people just give us like three months exports and say, go, go figure out there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so we basically then, go to, we have domain experts who will basically look at this, uh, feed, we feed it to the model and it tries to then you know, uh, tell us uh, if there is a memory. I'll actually talk about, this is one of our multivariate algorithms. I'll talk about that in the workshop. Uh, uh, in, in between, you said um, that because there's, it's hard to get kind of feedback from customers and to get the data back, you you switch from supervised learning to kind of unsupervised. And, but what does that mean? That kind of like, what is then? What are you lacking if if you kind of like then use the unsupervised version? What if that? Yeah, so I'll clarify, we don't switch as such. Uh, you know, we have unsupervised algorithms which do some job that they are supervised that we, you know, uh, that gets deployed. Um, what, what happens is uh, it's, it's really up to the comfort level of the customer to give, give us the feedback. And so, like, like I said, there are some customers who are generous and they'll give us big exports of our database, right? They'll say, they'll take this data back. So we have to, you know, we do get data back in, in some cases. We also have our own SaaS environments, like so all of these feed and capabilities are available, both on-prem deployment uh, you know, and then uh, SaaS things hosted kind of So, uh, you know, there we get access to actual feedback from customers. Uh, that's within our we also look at. I was joking when I said it's really hard. It is hard, I may, I'll tell you that, but uh, it's not impossible. Any other questions? Uh, thanks, guys. Oh, sorry. Was there a question? Thank you, guys. Thank you for your support. Guys, we would like to thank all the sponsors and participants and the speakers for attending MI Summit, the one and only free event in Munich regarding artificial intelligence. It will become even bigger for the next years because we believe that the science should be heaped free. Yeah! Yay!